For our visitors, it's been a great pleasure by, uh, to have you here at the home of the Fearless Influencer. And uh, we started a series last Sunday called Born Identity. And basically we are saying the same way people lose their identity, it can also happen to a church community. That we forget about our DNA, we forget about the things that we're supposed to be focusing on. Uh, uh, we, we can forget about our distinctive traits as a community. And so we decided to go, to, back, uh, to go back to God's word and learn about our kingdom identity. How can our kingdom identity align to the things that matter to God? And so throughout this series, there are a couple of questions that we shall be seeking to answer. What is our born identity as Mavuno Hill City? Who are we? Who are you? Why are we here and now? What are our distinctive traits or DNA as a church or a movement? And what should we be known for as a community, as Mavuno Church Hill City? And one thing I said last Sunday, it is impossible to know where we are going and what we are capable of doing if we don't know who we are. It is so hard even to dream. It is so hard to come and say this is what God can do in, in us and through us if we really don't know our identity. And so last Sunday we looked at our first distinctive trait as a, as a community. Which was what? What is our first DNA? Passion for? Passion for the lost. And we say what? If people matter to God, they should matter to? Okay, remind your neighbor right now. If people matter to God, they should matter to me. And I'm glad for as many who invited people to church, you were able to have a conversation with a neighbor. I thank God because I was able to invite one of my neighbor's kids to church. So I'm happy. I'm happy to leave out this message. And so today, as I begin my second sermon, as we look at our second distinctive trait, I want to do a bit of some exercise. A little exercise today. So I want you to pair up with your neighbor, and I want you to have your ten fingers up like this. I'm going to ask you questions. And because they're in church, I don't want you to lie. Okay? So if I'm going to ask you a question. If you get it, let your finger be up. If you don't get it, I want you to drop your finger. Is that okay? So, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some advertising slogans. And your job is to tell me which brand that represents. Are we okay? So, I want you to work in pairs. And I'm, going, I'm only giving you three seconds as neighbors, as a group. And I want to see who is smarter now. Okay? So, number one. Toyota. Okay, if you got it, then come with my friend. Who is the man in my foot? I am in it. Yes, we rock or see whatever. Just do it. If you got it, get it, drop it. One happiness. Ah, not one. Open happiness. Open happiness. It keeps going and going and going. I know. 
Mondom, hogy a szakmait nem. Minden nem ülj most. You know, when you talk about brands and their slogans, as I thought about this song when I sing, when people think about church, what's the slogan? When people say Mavuro is city, what's the slogan? Fearless. That's fearless. And as I thought I said, when people think about church or Christians, what jumps into their mind? What perceptions do people have about church? And to find out the answer, this is what I did this week. I was able to send a text to some friends who are not Christianized and on church they care nothing about church. And I asked them, guy, when you hear the word Christian or church, what comes to mind? And I thank God because all, actually, all of them responded. But some of them were like, ouch, what did I ask? So one of them said, the church is after your money. Mm -hmm. Another one told me, Christians are hypocritical. They lack the moral authority to instruct or lead people. That one hurt me. And then another one said, actually this one here is not even church. He just wrote me, the church, question mark. Who cares? Question mark. <laughs> and he, I was about to tell him, you wasted your, your, your SMS. Anyway, the church, who cares? Another one told me, very, very judgmental and negative, that Christians police people. Uh-huh. Another one told me the church is oppressive, too many rules. Another one told me the church is intolerant about other religions. Uh -huh. Another one told me the church is irrelevant. It's stuck in the past. Hashtag boring. <laughs> now, for many of us, your immediate reaction is that the stereotyping of Christians is grossly unfair. Not every single one of us is what they just described. Not all Christians are boring. Have you, have you come to our church? <laughs> Not all Christians are boring. Our churches are boring, more judgmental. And there are many people, many Christians, and many uh, Christians of our organizations that are doing great things in our society, in education, caring for the poor, educating the orphans, working for social justice. And lastly, I just said, my conclusion was like, you know what? It is expected the world will always be hostile to followers of Jesus Christ. And even the Bible warned us against this, that one day the world will rise up, they will persecute us. But that thing, the truth of one of your city, is that the world today is increasingly getting suspicious of, and they are suspicious of us as Christians, as the church, and they're becoming hostile towards the church or Christians. And while some of their sentiment might be unfair and inaccurate, maybe the problem as to why the church is receiving this kind of feedback and suspicion is because we have wandered away from our own identity. Maybe for them, what they know about church and what they see is totally different. The life that Jesus came, he lived and came to call us to. And so today, I want us to look at our second distinctive trait, our born identity. Tell your, tell your neighbor, passion to change the world. Tell your neighbor, passion to change the world. So I'm going to take you to an interesting conversation that is happening between a lawyer or an expert in the religious law and Jesus. And uh, I want us to read Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 29. A very interesting conversation that is happening. And we're gonna just talk about what does it mean to be passionate to change the world? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Let me start reading. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to, to, uh, to test Jesus by asking him this question. Underline the word to test. To test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, 
What should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, Do this, and you will live. The man wanted to do what? Justify. Come on, church, wanted to do what? Justify. When do you seek to justify yourself? When you are wrong. As in this guy, you know, they, they, they normally say the guilty always run when no one pursues. As if they're having a conversation, but the Bible clearly says the guy is seeking to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? I want us to pose. And so one day, this religious expert asked Jesus a question and is testing him, his view of the ethical obligations of the law they have lived by. You need to know that the religious leader or this expert had mastered the Mosaic law that had been passed on to the children of Israel hundreds of years back. They knew the law inside out, which is more like us. We know the Bible inside out. And so this leader asked a question. He probably knows the answer to it. Or maybe he had read about it. So his motive at this particular time may not be very, very clear at the beginning. But we're going to see his, his motivation uh, as we continue to unpack this story. So look at the question he asked. Teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And this is a question that he knew the answer to. He was an expert. And every time I read the gospel, I love the way Jesus responds with such wisdom and authority to the question that people used to ask him. So instead of giving the answer to the expert of the law, what does he do? He directs him back to the same law. Instead of telling him, oh, let me tell him, ah, Jesus, like, let me take you back to the same law. And so Jesus asked the religious leader, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? So he is inviting the opinion of the lawyer, of the expert. How do you interpret the law? And he answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and, as, and, and your neighbor as yourself. The expert's answer is satisfactory as far as it goes. It is based on the Old Testament passages in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if, I, if I'm not wrong, and Leviticus. And so at this particular time, he's okay. He has passed the test. And these particular laws were so fundamental to the Jewish life and worship. And so Jesus tells him, you have answered correctly. And even tells him, do these things and you will leave. Simple case closed. Next. But then now, look. The writer of the book tells us something. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Why did this guy ask this question? What was he seeking to justify himself for? Where was he guilty? Why is it that the Bible says he was trying to get a way out of his actions? What had he done? And so, look, he uses a very strong word here, which reveals the expert's intention. I want you to see something over here. The law, according to the expert, was a kind of a contract with God by which he could earn eternal life. Look at the, the first question. He said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Me and you, we know that eternal life does not come by us doing, it comes by us being. Are you tracking with me? So first of all, he's missing the point. He's asking Jesus, what can I do to go to heaven? And yet the gospel says, going to heaven or having eternal life is through a relationship with Jesus, with God. It's not a matter of doing. 
answer to him. It's all about what can I do as a pastor. And so, to him the law, he wanted a rule, a set of rules that he could keep, and so he could justify himself. And so the question, who is my neighbor, exposes his heart. And this is what he wanted to justify himself for. He wanted to justify himself by limiting the extent of the law's demand because he knew there were people he didn't want to love. By asking the question, who is my neighbor, he was expecting Jesus to tell him, your neighbor looks like this. Because as a next part of the law, there are people he knew I can't love. And that's why Luke was very categorical to say, seeking to justify himself. There were people he couldn't love. There were people that it were so hard to love. If I may rephrase his words, he was asking Jesus, what kind of a person is worthy of my love, Jesus? That is what he's asking. What kind of a person is worthy of my love? Can you see Christians there? Okay, can you talk? Don't you see ourselves in there? Even as we ask, so who is my neighbor? Because we are seeking to justify <coughs> ourselves. And so for him, he said, what kind of a person is worthy of my love? And this man, like many of us, had interacted with many who are not worthy of his love. His experience had probably taught him that not everyone can be loved the same way. Kulikwana names or categories of people. That's what has been taught. And so, hearing the wisdom of Jesus, he was looking for a loophole that, he might, that might give him a free ticket to heaven and justify himself. And many times, we also take the word of God and conveniently justify our actions, but many a times we look for a loophole when, our, when his word doesn't make sense to us or doesn't appeal to the season we are in. And so, again, Jesus doesn't answer him. He doesn't go and tell him, my friend, your neighbor is eh, 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 ah. Jesus responds by telling a story that aims at the core of his heart. And that is what we're going to look at right now. Let's go to verse 30. Let's read together. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him off his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Let's pause. I wanted to know something. Jesus was such a relevant teacher. In those days, that road was the most dangerous road. It used to be a road among the hills, was surrounded by hills, and it was famous for crime and magic. And Jesus, to actually be relevant and connect with them, actually used the same road to tell his story. And so it wasn't surprising for Jesus to tell, uh, to tell this story by actually highlighting Jerusalem to Jericho. Let's go to verse 31. By chance, a priest came along. Tell a neighbor, a priest. Uh, you need to say like a priest. A priest. A priest. Came along. But when he saw the man lying there, what did he do? He crossed to the other side. Just tell a neighbor, very bad. Very, very bad. He crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Tell a neighbor, verse 32, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. What did he do? But he also passed by on the other side. Bad. Hashtag bad. Now, both the priest and the Levite, they represent the religious officials. These were categories of the religious officials. They saw, the Bible actually says it was a Jewish guy. They saw their brother, one of their own, lying in his terrible state. 
but neither of them did anything. The Bible says categorically, like daylight, they crossed over on the other side of the road. And by the way, I love reading the Bible with my imagination. I ask myself, what excuses did they give if they were Kenyans? That's what kind of excuses did they give for them to cross on the other side of the road? Thank you. Maybe the road is too generous for me to stop and help the man. Hey, it's Jericho. It's the land, oh my God. It's the land. I can't stop. Maybe it's about someone has said he might be a decoy for an ambush. Right? Yeah, I agree, by the way. It could be. Another excuse could be man, I've got to go to LG and perform the service for the Lord. Hallelujah. I am late for worship, man. I need to go because I have some duties in there. Jesus and the Samaritans. 
come to the world. That's how serious it was. Kuzikisha hai. The Jews even saw the Samaritans as worse of the Gentiles. So if a Jew is teaching, don't have a gentle woman give birth. Because if that baby comes to the world, you are helping another forbidden tribe or whatever race to come into the world. But then now, according to a Samaritan, they were even worse than Gentiles. They were hated. You could not be seen even walking through Samaria. Samaria, you couldn't. And here we are. Jesus is saying, a Samaritan guy comes and has compassion on him. Verse 34, what does he do? Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If this bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I'm here. Instead of passing by, the Samaritan loved him with a sacrificial love. Listen, church, he didn't wait to be asked to do it. He saw a need in front of him, and that was enough to, cause, to compel him for to action. He didn't wait to see a hashtag trending. He didn't wait to see it on news. Uh -uh. As long as he saw it, that was enough for him to compel him to action. And the Bible says he also gave freely of his time and resources. And he gave to Denari to provide for the man's needs in the inn for the next two or three weeks. And so, because of the resentment, the Samaritans and the Jews held uh, uh, for each other. The compassion and action of the Samaritan in the parable is surprising. He reflects the lens to which love can go and will go. He treats the injured man not as an enemy, but as a neighbor, like one of his own. Verse 36, verse 3. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Let me say to you, church, right here is the heart of the parable. In asking the last, the last question, Jesus now placed the expert in the story. He brought him into the story. Now he has to identify the neighbor, not from his perspective, but from the perspective of the man lying on the ground. Who is your neighbor? Not from your perspective, but from the perspective of someone lying with a knee on the ground. Who is your neighbor? And at that time, I believe the expert, the, 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 the expert, his heart started pumping because he knew where this story was going. He knew what Jesus was asking. Because from the dying man's perspective, the religious leader knew if he was the one with the law that he knows, with the God-fearing attitude he had, he could not have done that. And so, from that perspective, the religious leader says, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. The religious leader, and they look at that scripture, even if he says Samaritan, tell me what I'm None. Even to say the name Samaritan was hard. He said, the one who showed mercy. Now, I want you to track for me a little bit. Jesus changes the question. What was the question that this expert had asked previously? Who is... Uh, you're not talking to me. What was the question? 
person is my neighbor, to what kind of a person am I? Who should I be? What kind of a person should I be? Instead of asking who is my neighbor, Jesus changed the question and said, who are you? Who am I? You know, let me tell you Mabuno Hill City, and when I talk about Mabuno Hill City, it includes me. It is easy to think of people in our neighborhood as our neighbors. It is easy to think of our friends and families, or family, or people who are just like us as neighbors. But when Jesus told this parable, he asked, which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by robbers? The expert had asked, who is my neighbor? Who deserves my love? But Jesus said, the real question should be, who should I be a neighbor to? Ask your neighbor right now, who am I a neighbor to? Okay, ask your neighbor, who are you a neighbor? Okay, that one. Okay, just say, who am I a neighbor to? Jesus comes in and changes the equation. Remember, this guy was a Jew. There are people he has grown up hating. That regardless of what they might be going through, they have been taught, those people are bad, those people are bad, those people are bad. And so he's coming to Jesus to be justified. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, even Jesus said, but now Peter is saying, ah, forget about who you're supposed to love. The question is, are you a loving person? Are you a loving person? What kind of a person am I to those near me? The Samaritan has shown real love and compassion to someone in need. The expert of the law had looked the other way. He knew the law. But then he said this Mabuno church, knowing the Bible is not enough. Knowing the Bible is not enough. Enough. God is calling us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And you have to put it into practice. You have to show love to those in need. Can I preach? The world is not looking. They are not ready to hear how much we love God. They want to see how that love is changing us into the people that we are supposed to become. They don't want to hear about mercy. They want to see us becoming merciful. They don't want to say about love. They want to see loving people going out there and doing what they need to do. Like, can I say something right now that's going to hurt you? The world is not looking for our theology. They are looking for us to be practical. And how theology can be practical in this world? The world is not even this man, but the others. We can sit here and talk about revelation, about the white horse and the grey horse. The thing is, after going out here, how will the horses be practical for us to love people? Come on now. Huh? Okay, tell me about Come on now. Huh? We are talking. Why did Jesus choose to, like, to illustrate this subject with a priest and a liver? Why? Have you ever asked yourself why did Jesus, for heaven's sake, choose a Levite and a priest? Who are church leaders? I think the Levite was a worship leader. I'm not talking about Jumaluk. <laughs> and me as the priest of this church. Why is he using us as an example? And I want to say this, Mahuna. It is, is it not a warning to all of us that there are far too many people who are caught up in the mechanics of religious activity with no true love for those who are in need. Is it what Jesus is warning us? Do not be caught up in the mechanics of religious activity, but you have no love to those who are in need or who need, who need help. And the church of today could easily be saved from lost its identity. We have become so good at talking about what should be done that we forget it must be done. We talk about what must be done and 
and you forget that it must be done. Where is the church when it comes to impacting our city? And maybe, let me just say maybe, the reason why people are not coming to church, it is not that they are rejecting Jesus, it's because they are rejecting me and you. They look at your salvation and say, by the way, let me remain a atheist. Is that what Christianity is all about? If this Christianity is all about us and being parked in speaking in tongues for five hours, but you see someone in need and you walk by singing your powerful worship, guys are not rejecting Jesus, they are rejecting what the church represents. Our failure, our failure of not being good neighbors. The world wants to see, as I said, how we are translating our theology into practice. That's what they want to see. When I look at this story, I see three things about love. Number one, love sees distress. Tell your neighbor, love sees distress. The Bible says a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and he saw him. Let me ask you, are you busy to see people who are hurt? Are you so preoccupied with your plans, ambition and ambition that you're not seeing somebody next to you who is happy? Love sees. They see. Let me ask you, does your love for God enable you to see people who are happy? Or are you so preoccupied with your life that you don't see the people around you? Ask your neighbor, who is your dying man on the, on, on the ground? Who is your dying man? Who is your dying man? Who is that person that has been broken, abused, rejected, in need, and they are lying somewhere, but you are busy singing your kumbaya song, worshipping in tongues, and driving away as far as you can, not to be even close to the people who are broken. Let me ask you, Mabuno City, who is your dying man? Love sees distress. Is it a co-worker that you have been ignoring? Is it someone who is discouraged? A struggling friend or a family member who needs your help? Number two, love responds with compassion. Tell the love responds with compassion. When he saw him, he had compassion on him. That's what the Bible says. Listen, church. Listen. He did just feel bad. It wasn't a matter of just feeling bad. No. Because of the hopeless situation this guy was in. No. He responded with compassion. The wounded man helpless condition moved the Samaritan to action. And this is the point at which many of us will retreat. Why? Because helping someone will cost you money and time. And that's what you don't want, man. I have my own issues, man. I have debts to clear. Come on. Too much. But love responds with compassion. Have you ever seen this on Twitter and Facebook the Oishé that we have as Kenyans? And 99% of those people are Christians. Oh, ee, so bad. Oh, ee. But I ask myself, where is the church? Where are, where are we as Christ followers? Number three, love responds with practical solution. Tell me about practical solution. The Bible says he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, that he set him on his own animal. He spent an extra mile by taking the injured man to the, to the inn and paid the innkeeper to take care of him. He solved the problem with a practical effort to relieve the distress. He didn't pray for him. Miracles happened, guys. He didn't pray for him for a miracle to happen. He did something. He solved the problem 
with a practical solution. What am I saying, Maguno Church, today? This is my one message today. We will only change the world by being the church and not just by going to church. Let me say this again. We will only change the world by being the church and not just by going to church. Tell that to your neighbor. Come on, if you can put it up. We will only change the world by being the church and not just by going to church. My hope and prayer, guys, as I come to the conclusion, Mabuno Church in City will be known for her love that will change the world. Since we began Mabuno Church 13 years ago, it's been a prayer that this church will be so useful to the community around here that if one day the government ever shuts us, the community will have placards saying Mabuno Hill City is not going anywhere. That one day, if the government decides to shut us off, the Muslims around this area are going to say, do not touch that church. Not because of the cars parked at the parking space, but because Mabuno Hill City will be known as a church that loves its neighbors and its community. We want to be a blessing to our city. Maybe you have stopped believing that this church can make a radical difference around this area. But can I tell you something? I have never stopped a moment to believe what God can do through this church. It wasn't just a fancy name we looked for. That is the reason as to why we are called Mabuno Hill City. Because we are a city on a hill that will shine its light and spread its mercy to the people around this community. We shall be the light of the world. We are a church that releases people who are compelled by Islam to live out their purpose and change the world. As the mission states, turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society, my prayer that we're going to change our world through acts of love, through acts of kindness and generosity. And I want to ask you again, Mahuru, who is your dying man on the road? If there are a group of people who are centered around Jesus, we must reflect his heart of generosity, of love and compassion to a dying world. Jesus has called us to be the light and the sword, to be the people who will spread out his love, to become his feet and his hands in a broken and hopeless world. And I want to proclaim on this stage today, Mabuno Hill City, that Mabuno Church Hill City has been called to bring and to make a radical difference around this area, in Africa and around the world. Imagine with me today. Imagine with me. What will happen if every single one of you, starting next year, if you can give one hour every month to love our neighbor? Imagine what will happen. Imagine what will happen when every month a Mabuno Hill City member is going to a children's home to love on their kids and to provide for them. Imagine what will happen when our members go to school to mentor young girls and young boys only one hour every month. Imagine what will happen every month you can be choosing to go to see someone, to go and see when you go to shops. You don't go with shopping for your parents only. And you're going to take shopping for an old person in your village and say, no. I cannot change the world by going to church. I change the world by becoming their church. Imagine what will happen if today we commit that next year, every single one of us, that we shall be given one hour every month to love on something. I cannot even start imagining the kind of impact we are going to have 
in our society. And my prayer, may we break from our selfish individual cartoons and be part of a radical community that changes our city through the power of love. Tell your neighbor, it begins right here. Tell your neighbor, it begins right here. Mavuno, Mavuno, the city, our country, our continent is ready for the power of love. That's the only way we can change the world. They listen to me. The two hour Christianity has nothing. Out there. That's where impact happens. 